the first Pentecost day after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and recorded for us the, the first gospel sermon which Peter and the other apostles preached. And at the conclusion of this sermon, the audience was moved. Their uh, hearts pricked, the Bible says, verse 37. And they asked Peter and the other apostles uh, what they were to do. And Peter said, verse 38, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In verse 41, the Bible says, They that gladly received his word were baptized. The same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Not only do we read here of the first gospel sermon, we read of the first individuals added to the Lord's church. In verse 47, those that were being saved from their past sins, those that had uh, been translated out of darkness and into the kingdom of light. And there are interesting points that are necessary for us to understand salvation and ch the church and there are some very necessary points that we need to remember. And there are some very necessary components that pointed towards the, the entrance into the kingdom, the entrance uh, into the church, and the means by which a person was saved. All three being pointed here in this text as being the same. And in the very next chapter, in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, in essence a parallel verse to Acts chapter 2, verse 38, which was the beginning of the response to the individuals who had asked Peter and the others, what must we do? What shall we do? Based upon the sermon that had been preached. And the interesting component of this verse which helps us to understand what God wants us to be in this life is, uh, is pointed out. We read, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now, if we look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, we see that basically this is verse is saying the exact same thing using some different terminology, but terminology that can help us understand what God intended. In Acts chapter 2 verse 38, we read, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in order to have your sins remitted, for the remission of sins. To fully understand that and to fully define that in the very next chapter we read repent and be converted and so baptism uh, being the the culminating mode or the culminating factor by which an individual is seen as being converted and for those who would uh, doubt that baptism is the point at which an individual receives remission of sins. Verse uh, 19 of chapter 3 says that your sins may be blotted out. That the blotting out of sins does not take place before conversion, 
and repentance, and therefore the blotting out of sins or remission of sins cannot take place before repentance and baptism. Chapter 2, verse 38. Baptism is one key component. It is the last component, the culminating component, uh, of a plan that God put together in order to have individuals free themselves from sin. But what God ultimately wants is conversion. Repent and be converted. That's the end result. The end result is to be converted. To not just have been an individual who believed at one point, repented at one point, confessed the name of Christ at one point, and even been baptized at one point. God in Acts chapter 2 tells us that those individuals, having obeyed the gospel, having obeyed the plan to save, were added to the church and were considered among the saved. Acts 2 verse 47. But ultimately what God wanted, what made those individuals saved, was that in addition to those acts of obedience, these individuals were converted. They were changed. They didn't just do one point actions. They did act obediently each and every time. But the reason they acted in such a way is because they had changed. They had been converted. And conversion is what we see in the book of Acts from this point on. We read of individuals who lived one type of life or lived a lifestyle uh, who changed their lifestyle and mirrored it and patterned it after what we know as the New Testament. Referred to in Acts chapter 2 as the Apostles' Doctrine. Also uh, pointed out by Paul and Peter and others as the idea of preaching Jesus or preaching Christ. In Acts chapter 8, Philip refers to it as preaching Jesus or preaching Christ. And in this example of conversion, we see that there's more to it than just these point actions, these actions that take place at a particular point. That it's a lifestyle change, that, that these acts that take place perhaps at one point in time are not individually, but they are combined together to culminate in what we know as conversion. And that's what God wants. He wants an individual who has changed, turned from that old life and has started to live a new life, a life of a Christian. And so conversion entails much more than just point actions, right? Yes, all those uh, components, what we know as the five acts or the five uh, points of salvation, those five steps of salvation, each individually are, are, are important and each put together are equally important. But what God wants is the end result and that's a converted individual. A Christian is a converted individual, one who has been converted it involves more than just these point actions. It involves a change in conduct. It involves a change in attitude. It involves a change of perception and priority. It, it involves a change in, in life and purpose in life. And so we see that as we look at several of the conversions, or all of the conversions, and we'll just have, take the time to look at a few, but in all of the conversions in the book of Acts, we see this idea of change, right? Yes, each of these changes included these point actions, but it was much more than the point action that God wanted. Notice in, in Acts chapter 8, Philip, verse 5, went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things 
which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Now, what Philip preached was Christ. But notice what the people say in verse 6, or what they believed. It says, they with one accord gave heed to those things which Philip spake. Well, I thought he just preached Jesus Christ. I just thought he preached Christ. Well, to preach Christ means to preach more than just one thing, apparently, because when he preached Christ, in verse 6, the Bible says, they with one, author one accord gave heed unto those things. Whatever those things are included in preaching Christ. And later in uh, chapter 8, we read of a man of Ethiopia. And the Holy Spirit tells Philip to go and preach to him. In verse 29. In verse 30, we read Philip ran thither to him and heard him, the Ethiopian, read the prophet Isaiah. And Philip said, Understandest thou what thou readest? First, we point out here, not only did preaching Christ include more than just Jesus himself, or preaching about Jesus, or the name of Jesus, the people that Philip had preached to in Samaria who believed, believed those things that were in, included in preaching Christ. And now, Philip says, do you understand? So in order to be converted, there are things that we need to hear, we need to know, and we need to understand. You can't be converted without knowledge. You can do all these point actions, but if you don't hear and know and understand, you can't be converted. Individuals can partake in particular points of action, not know why they did it, for whom they did it, why or what purpose is behind doing it, and not be converted. You can do all kinds of things and not be converted. To be converted, an individual has to understand. They have to know. We have to have a certain amount of knowledge in order to be converted. And that's why Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? We also note that he, this man that Philip came up upon was reading. And that's an important thing to note. Right? We have, to have, we have to understand things, but we have to be willing to understand things. If you're not willing to know or willing to read or willing to study or willing to understand, then you can't be converted. So many people today want to be converted. They want to be saved from their past sins and do nothing about it. Have nothing of their own responsibility to do about it. They want it done to them rather than to do it for themselves. This Ethiopian eunuch was interested in his own salvation so much so that he was reading. He was studying. He was looking for the truth. Now, he didn't have the truth at the time. He didn't have the truth at the time. But he was in the right place, wasn't he? He was in the right place. He was in the Word of God. And so he was a truth seeker. People who are truth seekers generally are going to find the truth. Jesus said, if you seek, you'll find. It's not just enough to be a truth seeker, though. You know, a lot of people have been truth seekers. They found the truth, didn't like what they, liked, what they found, and they ran away from it. A lot of people have done that. A lot of people have been truth seekers, obeyed the truth, and then ran away later after they obeyed the truth. They quit, they quit doing the truth. They quit seeking the truth, and they've fallen away. But this man has his priorities right in order to be converted. He's seeking the truth. He wants to know the truth. He wants to understand the truth. And of course, the man responds to Philip's question about understanding. He said, how can I accept some man guide me? He wanted to know more. He wanted to know more. He didn't want to know less. And he didn't want to have something done for him. He wanted to know more. And so, Philip sits down with the man and studies with him from the Word of God. And we know that 
what he preached unto this Ethiopian eunuch was the same thing he preached to those in Samaria. He preached Jesus. He preached Christ. In verse 35 it says, Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Now what did he preach? Well, some might say, well, he just preached about Jesus being a good man who came to this, uh, li- who came to this earth and lived a perfect life. Or some might say, well, that he preached that Jesus was the Son of God. He put on flesh. And he died for the sins of mankind. Or they might say, well, he just preached what Jesus said while he was here on this earth. We know that whatever it was, it was multiple things, right? Because the Sumerians uh, said they, they gave heed to those things which Philip spake. And when we read verse 36, it says, As they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Whatever it means to preach Jesus or to preach Christ must include water baptism, else this Ethiopian eunuch would have never heard of water baptism. Somebody said, well, how do you know that? Well, in Isaiah 53, where the eunuch started, you don't read of any individual being baptized. So I know that when Philip started to preach Jesus, he started in Isaiah 53, but he didn't end there. (laughs) He didn't end there. This Ethiopian eunuch wanted to know more. He wanted to hear more. And Philip preached unto him about Jesus. And to be in Christ, which means to have one, to be in a relationship with Jesus uh, that makes us right with God, to be in Jesus or to be in Christ, the Bible tells us we have to be baptized into Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and verse 4. And no doubt Philip had taught this eunuch If you want to be in Christ, you have to be baptized because that eunuch said, here's water, what do I need to do to be baptized? So in verse 37, Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And the eunuch answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still and they both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. A few important points. In every act of conversion that we read in the book of Acts, every time an individual turned from darkness and was added to the body of Christ, he heard the gospel. He believed the gospel. He repented of his past sins. He confessed that Jesus was the Christ and he was immersed in water. Every time. Every every conversion you read about in the book of Acts includes all five of those acts. Every time. Well, someone might say, well, Brad, I just don't read that in Acts chapter 8. It said, if you believe with all your heart, you can be saved. Well, that's true. You have to believe with all your heart. But what was he supposed to believe? (laughs) He was supposed to believe the preaching of Jesus, right? He was supposed to be believing preaching of Christ. Whatever Philip preached to him, he was supposed to believe it. Now we know that Philip preached unto him about water baptism because he said, see, here is water. What do I need to do to be baptized? We know that he was told to confess that Jesus was the Christ because he said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We also know in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and verse 33, Jesus said, if you don't confess me before men, I'm not going to confess you before my Father in heaven. We also know that the man repented. Where does it say he repented? Well, Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You can't can't believe, confess, and be baptized and not repent of your past sins and be saved. 
Jesus said, if you don't repent, you'll perish. So we know that this man repented of his past sins. We also know that in order to uh, be converted, Acts chapter 3 verse 19, the Bible says repent and be converted. You can't be converted unless you repent. At every conversion that you read about in the, in the book of Acts, all five of those components are there. By necessity. Else, they weren't obeying the gospel of Jesus. If they did any other thing other than that, they did not obey the preaching of the Christ. Because that's the very definition of preaching Jesus and preaching Christ. Now in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 and following, in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, we find that all those components, the, the, the fact that uh, faith is required, of course we know faith is required. He said, I believe, but it didn't have to tell me he believed. Because I know in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it's, without faith it's impossible to please God. <laughs> you, they could have, God could have left out the fact that this man believed and I'd have still known he believed because if you don't believe, you can't please God. We know what he believed. He believed the preaching of Jesus and the preaching of Christ and we know that all those components are necessarily included in that. We also know this, that only after the eunuch was converted, only after he heard the gospel, only after he repented of his past sins, only after he confessed that Jesus was the Christ, only after he was immersed in water to have his sins away, uh, washed away, did he then go away rejoicing. He didn't rejoice until after all of those things. It's because he wasn't converted until after that. He wasn't saved until after that. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, repent and be baptized. Then you'll have your sins remitted. You don't have your sins remitted before you believe. You don't have your sins remitted before you repent. You don't have your sins repented before you confess. You don't have your sins repented before you're immersed in water. You obey the gospel, then your sins are remitted. Repent and be converted. You're not converted until after all those things take place. But we see the change that took place in this Ethiopian eunuch, didn't we? He didn't understand. He didn't know. And then he said, see, here's water. What do I need to do? And then he did it. Conversion requires not only knowing, but follow through. Conversion requires follow through. This Ethiopian eunuch followed through with what he heard. He did not just hear and accept it and leave, and be, uh, leave as he was. He heard the word, he believed it, and he acted upon it. And therefore he was converted. We also note in Acts chapter 9, another conversion, the conversion of Saul, who later's name was changed to Paul. And if you'll drop down to verse 17, after Saul has seen the Christ, been told where to meet Ananias, and Ananias told to go meet with Saul. And they meet, as God had intended. Ananias was told by God to preach to Saul. Paul or Saul was told to go hear what Ananias had to tell him. And after Ananias preached to Saul, and after Saul had heard what Ananias had to tell him, 
Verse 18, the Bible says, Immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. He received his sight forthwith, and he arose and was baptized. And straightway, verse 20, he preached Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. Now we see true conversion in the life of Saul whose name changed to Paul. Because in verse 1 of Acts chapter 9, we read of a man named Saul who breathed out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. <laughs> we read of a man who stood by and held the coats of individuals who stoned Stephen. And he went on his way in verse 2 to put men and women into prison for believing in Jesus. <laughs> for doing what the Ethiopian eunuch had done. For preaching what Philip had preached in the previous chapter. He went from that to being baptized into Christ And preaching Christ. Straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Now that's a complete turnaround, isn't it? That's the definition of conversion. A complete turnaround. A man who once persecuted the church, who once breathed threatenings to members of the church, who saw its demise was now a member of it and encouraging people to obey the gospel. That's a complete turnaround, isn't it? It's true conversion. A true change in life. And that's what God wants in us. Obviously, uh, our prior life may have not been quite like Saul's, but whatever it is, God expects us to, to get rid of it and to turn into something new, to be something different. And so when Paul would go on to write letters for the cause of Christ and preach for the cause of Christ as he helped congregations get planted around the known world. He would tell them of conversion and what it meant. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God, from idols. Turned from God, or turned to God from idols. So Paul had turned to God from Judaism. And he's preaching that individuals turn from whatever separates them from God to God. But notice what else he says. How you turn to God from idols. Not just that they turn to God. And gave up their idols. But notice. Turn to God from idols. To serve. The living. And true God. Conversion requires. Knowledge. Conversion requires understanding. Conversion requires. A desire to know the truth. And seek the truth. And follow through. Once we know the truth. right? Obedience. But then it, desi it, it, in, it includes a lifetime of service. Not just to believe in God or to accept God and to reject idols or whatever it was, but to actually live in accordance with God's will. To serve Him. Paul would go on in other books of the Bible to talk about how we can't serve God 
two masters. To be converted means that we have a new master. Our new master is not self. Our new master is the Lord. And we become the servant. We must also have a change in perspective. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul would write to the church at Philippi, Verse 4, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless. But what things were gained to me then, those I count as loss. For Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I might win Christ. Conversion requires us to have a new perspective. That not only do we live to serve God, but we live in dedication to God, and that our purpose has changed. That we don't see the world the same as we once did. That we don't see these point actions as merely point actions. We see them as things we can do to be right with God. We see them as part of the whole. right? Just part of the whole. The things we once valued we now consider to be waste. The things we value now are things that we look for in expectation. Things that we once did not consider to be of value, we now hold as our highest priority. Serving God. Living for God. Doing what God would have us to do. And of course, conversion leads us out of darkness and towards light. And the end result is a place with God in eternity. In James chapter 5, verse 19 and verse 20, James in the context is speaking of an individual who has been overtaken in a fault and uh, mature brothers and sisters in Christ going to the aid. But I want you to point, note something in this text in James 5, 19 and 20. James says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him. And of course, uh, convert means to change. So here's an individual <laughs> who has been converted, Right? But now he's gone back into the ways of the world. His priorities have gone back into the old ways. His perspective is back in the old ways. Uh, perhaps he has uh, failed to study and to know and to understand. And now he has erred from the truth. He's fallen away. And now he needs to be converted again. Now he doesn't need to go through all those point actions again. He simply needs to be penitent. and Ask God to forgive him. Because he's already obeyed the gospel and become a child of God. Now he's just a fallen away child of God. He doesn't need to become a child of God again. He's already become a child of God. He's just a child of God who's fallen away. But he needs to change. He needs to be converted. In verse 20 the Bible says, Let him know that he who converts the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. When we're converted, our destiny is changed. <laughs> no longer are we looking to a, down a path that leads to destruction or spiritual death. 
we see ourselves saved from our past sins. Today, an individual can be saved from his past sins. But it takes more than just those point actions. It takes more than just being here. It takes more than just hearing. and It takes more than just believing. But all these actions combined with the right attitude, the proper perspective, the desire to seek truth, know truth, and obey truth, and to serve God combined to produce an individual who is converted. And so if a man or woman today want to be converted, they can follow these same examples, follow the same pattern, and hear the gospel of Christ, believe it, and do what it says to do. If any individual here needs to be baptized in order to have their sins washed away, to be added to the church, we stand here to assist. If you've already obeyed those initial acts but have need to be turned back home, perhaps you've fallen away or have left your first love, we're here to assist you if we can as well as we stand and sing. There's a great day coming, a great day coming, there's a great day.